Welcome to the sixth presentation in the Wakefield Country Day School free online summer speaker series. My name is Paul Larner and I am chairman of the board. Our school is delighted to make this to make available this summer via Zoom an esteemed, diverse, and fascinating group of speakers. Our final session and proof of the diversity of subjects we have included will be next Wednesday at this same time on the subject of, quote, catfish farming in America, end quote, presented by Terry Hansen, professor of agriculture economics at Auburn University. Now for today's speaker and topic. Terry Miller is a Texas native residing in Suffolk, Virginia, with a speciality in museum curation, having founded three museums, the John J. Wright Museum in Spotsylvania, the Lawrence E. Graves Museum in Washington, D.C., and the Carver Museum in Culpeper. As you will see today, Terry is an accomplished researcher of historical subjects and genealogies. She received her BA from Texas Christian, an MBA from the University of Maryland, and did doc doctoral studies at Brandeis University. Terry has been a visiting lecturer at Wellesley College and Holy Cross. With that, I now turn it over to Terry Miller. Good evening, everyone. You could be anywhere, but you chose to be here with us today. And so I'm very happy about that. So now I'm gonna share the screen and we're gonna get started because I do not want to stand between you and dinner. Much, much less a cocktail. Definitely. All right, we are gonna get started. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I have two goals today. One is to inform you about the African-American men born in Rappahannock County who fought for the Union. And number two, to use their example to explore what it means to be an American. Now, this research was originally done for the development of the Carver Four County Museum. So it was originally put together from 2016 to early 2017 with an awful lot of time in the National Archives in DC. So the museum is of course closed until we decide what we're going to do to reopen it in COVID, but we are now transforming all of our exhibits into online exhibits. So this one, and we will be adding more, will be on our website, which is right here, right here, okay? Now, I'm gonna go through this in this order. Number one, what exactly are U.S. colored troops? And Based on that, why should a colored man enlist? Then from Rappahannock, how many actually did? Then I have two examples, one Richard Stevens and another James Whip. And last, we're just gonna close out with a couple of final thoughts. So, simply what are colored troops? They were any man who was not white, and they enlisted on the side of the Union to fight in favor of their freedom for the country of the United States. Now, they were able to do that by a series of laws, but the, most, the, the two most important I have listed here, the Emancipation Proclamation, of course, and then the War Depart Department issued General Order Number 143 on May the 22nd, uh, which allowed African-American men to join the war. And so they were able to organize into 
regiments and, and those, the critical things needed to be soldiers in a war. Now, there were many reasons given for why no one should arm colored men. And the most vocal ones were, well, why on earth would you want to give arms to black folks? They may turn those arms on us and, and kill us. And, and secondly, and it reverberates today through many other issues, they're just they're not capable of learning what to do. They're not smart enough. They can't be taught to use weapons. Don't do this because also it could empower them in ways that we don't know what to do. So they had to be persuaded. And there were two leading persuaders, particularly to recruit among colored men. Those two were Frederick Douglass and John Mercer Langston. Now let's do Frederick Douglass first. Uh, he had been on the scene for a very long time by the time the Emancipation Proclamation came about. He was in his 40s actually, and so he had been on the public stage for a very long time. What is most important to know about him is that he was an orator, a writer, and a newspaper publisher. And he used these particular skills right here to recruit both in person, in speeches, and then in his newspaper. Now in his newspaper, it was called the Douglas Monthly, in April of 1863, he wrote this article and he had nine points in trying to show why should a colored man enlist. I put three on here, but I want to call your attention to number six. Enlist and you make this your country in common with all other men born in the country or out of it. Now this I think is classic Frederick Douglass because what he's trying to do is remind all of us that he's talking here about immigrants, people who came to the United States from Western and Eastern European countries and Slavic countries to start their life here. So he's telling African-American men, look, make this your country in the same way that they made the United States their country. Now, John Mercer Langston was a different kind of man. He's very cultured. Um, he lived in Ohio. He was born, however, in Louisa County. But he ended up in Ohio where he graduated from Oberlin College. He became an attorney and an activist, eventually elected to Congress. And he also became president and is the first president of what we now know as Virginia State University in Petersburg. But he was mighty in his own way. And if any of our gentlemen who were born in Rappahannock and had been sold away or moved away and lived in the Midwest, he would have been their key recruiter. Now, what do we, what are actually the lessons of these two men, even though they come from different backgrounds? The big lesson is that having earned their status and they earned it through education, through elocution, through work, and through property ownership. So they had the full measure of what it means to have the spirit of Americanism, which is that each man shall have his chance. So with that in mind, how many African-American men from Rappahannock joined to fight for their own freedom. From my count, through a heck of a lot of research in the National Archives, I have been able to positively confirm 48. There were four in the cavalry, one in light artillery, eight in heavy artillery, and 35 infantry men. 
Now, what I've done for you is list their names. So here are the cavalry. Now, later on in this talk, I'm going to talk about this gentleman here, James Whip. You have, here's your light artillery gentleman and heavy artillery. If you looked in the Rappahannock News several years ago when this uh, information was first presented, I believe I talked about James Grayson in that article. And then we have our 35 infantrymen. And they range in all ages from 18 to I think 42. Now I'm going to take you to this gentleman right here, Elias Tyler. And notice how he spells his name. It's T-Y-L-O-R. <laughs> and over time, everybody now is T-Y-L-E-R. But Elias Tyler fortunately had a file that had wonderful information in it. But what I like about this is it tells his life on one piece of paper. Number one, here's his name. He was the slave of this man, Robert Waters. He was in Missouri when he enlisted, born Rappahannock, Virginia. And this right here where it says entitled to bounty, what that means is, is that when his enlistment is over, the armed services will owe him money. He will get his military pay. But this is what I really love about all of these documents. This is my favorite. Just think, seconds before looking at this document, having it read to them, and then having them mark their X, because many of them could not write their names, or some who could. This document, they were slaves two seconds before having it read to them. And down here, it says, I, the name, do solemnly swear that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the United States of America, and that I will serve them honestly and faithfully against all their enemies or opposers, whomsoever, and that I will observe and obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the rules and articles of war. Congratulations, you are now a citizen of the United States. We're gonna look at two more uh, examples very briefly, Richard Stevens and James Whip. Richard Stevens is interesting as an example of becoming an American or having the American spirit. Born in Rappahannock, but look at this. He was enlisted in Rome, Georgia. Immediately you know that means that his family was sold south. And this is where he ended. Two months after he enlisted, however, he was captured and became a prisoner of war. Now, we have all heard stories of what happens to prisoners of war. And it was particularly um, wretched during this war if you were a colored man. You were usually killed. You were definitely tortured. But look at this. He remained a prisoner of war until January 1866. The war ended May the 9th, 1865. How did he stay alive all this time? Well, there's something called the Lieber Doctrine. And in actuality, Abraham Lincoln issued, I think it's General Order 100, that actually talked about how you treat prisoners of war. He was protected by law. He was protected in saying, now 
He is not a slave. He is a soldier, and he shall be treated like a soldier. Now, after he was released, he went back to Georgia, lived his life, lived a very long time. James Whip, I talk about him a lot. Because to me, this is the classic example of becoming Americanized. Born, of course, in Rappahannock in 1823. Let me get you back. Now, uh, uh, hold on. My fingers. There you go. Now, everybody knows there's a difference between being 20 years old and being 40 years old. You know a lot about who you are when you're 40 compared to when you're 20. So when he's 40, he makes his way, some kind of way, to Reedsville, Massachusetts. And he joins the 5th Massachusetts Colored Cavalry. That right there tells you he has a skill that very few people have. He is an expert horseman. And you cannot become a member of the cavalry unless you have skill on a horse, you can fight with a sword on that horse, and you can shoot on that horse. He was also in that unit with two people who were who are quite famous. One was the father of the poet Lawrence, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and one of the sons of Frederick Douglass. Being in the cavalry, he also was able to be in action. They were not just on garrison duty. So they were finally let, allowed to fight, and he was in the Second Battle of Petersburg. He fought in the final siege of Petersburg. But most importantly, the 5th Cavalry were the first units to enter Richmond after it was defeated. So he gets out of uh, the military later on in October of that year. He comes back. Now, Lots of people did not come back to Rappahannock. They went other places or they already were other places and they chose to be in those places. He chose to come home. And he comes home and he registers to vote. Here he is right here. And this was in October 22nd, 1867. He gets married for the first time a few years later. And he owns property. So everything that is expected of one to do to become a good American, um, he tries to do. And he, in his old age, applies for a pension. He gets his pension in 1889. He dies in 1896, and the government allowed his widow to continue receiving his pension. She died in 1935, and they did not have any children. Now, we're almost finished with me talking. We're going to go back. No, no, no. Hold on a second. I'm trying to take you back. That's me. Oops, 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 oops. Hold on a second. I'm going to take you back to where I want you to be. What I want you to tell me is, and tell me if you can see that. There you go. What I want you to tell me is, what other issues use similar reasons to exclude? It was very difficult for women to get the vote. And some of those reasons were, oh, they don't need to do that. It will mess up their brains. Their brains are for house things, not for thinking about politics. Oh my gosh, they can't register to vote. What will happen to the home if they do that? Oh, they can't register to vote. Then they will want to be like men. Native Americans were not able to get citizenship until 1924. 
they were not allowed to vote because, oh my, you have uh, reservation lands over there. Why don't you go over there and vote? You're not allowed to come over here to vote. Immigrants now serving in the military. People join the military because it is a noble thing to do and it is a way toward becoming an American citizen, an American. And that to them is giving them their chance. And last, my heart bleeds all the time because of immigrants trying to get into the United States today so that they can try and start their life in a new place and earn that label of being an American, having the opportunity to have a chance. Fear is not our friend. So I'm going to leave you with these two final thoughts. And they don't come from me. They come from the Honorable Franklin Lane. He was the U.S. Secretary for the Department of the Interior during World War I, when the government knew that they would be getting immigrants from Europe again, the next wave of immigrants after the war ended. And there was the question that he asked, what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to have the American spirit? So he says, can we gather together people of different races, creeds, conditions and aspirations who can be merged into one? If we cannot do this, we will fail. Indeed, we will have already failed. And I'll leave you with this one that really touches me. There must be a people who have a sense of coalescence and a sense of conservatism, which keeps them from destroying themselves while attempting to make themselves. I thank you for your time. And if you need to get in touch with me, that is how you can do it. Terry, thank yes. you for a wonderful presentation and it's obvious you're a natural born teacher. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to open it up for questions. Um how do I May I ask to How do I ask a question? Whoop. How do I do this? Uh, you, you, you just unmute and ask your question. I'm ready with mine, if I may. Okay, Hugh, why don't you go ahead? We'll start with you, and then Greg, you can be second. Ms. Miller, that was terrific, or Professor Miller. I appreciated that and um, wanted to ask, I don't know how broad your research was. It was obviously deep but was Rappahannock's experience typical of other counties in Virginia or maybe other counties in our part of Virginia? And the second question, I remember reading somewhere that slaves were sometimes made to hunt as part of their duties on plantations. And so there were, there actually were some that were adept with using firearms. Is that true? Okay, number one, Rappahannock's experience is very similar to all other counties in Virginia, but specifically so in your region, meaning Orange, Madison, and Culpeper, okay? Number two, and I'm not, not quite sure about your question. Are you asking me about slaves in particular or, or gentlemen who were 
um, in the armed services. It had to do with your recitation of the the arguments against having colored troops. Okay. And you mentioned that they they wouldn't know how to handle a weapon, and I, um, based on that earlier reading I had done, it seemed to be patently not true. Uh, I'm going to agree with you on that. And those arguments we find are always invalid. Uh, they are convenient things to say, oh, please don't do that. <laughs> so you are absolutely correct. People knew how to use weapons. They just were not organized into army units so that they could do so in support of their country. Thank you. You're welcome. Greg? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, am I on? Yes. Yes, you're on. Well, well, well thank you. Well, uh, Ms. Miller, you already know my question because I sent you an, an email. Um, we have a statue on the courthouse property of, of Rappahannock <laughs> County uh, honoring the uh, residents of Rappahannock County who fought for the Confederacy. The statue's inscription says their cause was, quote, righteous. Uh, you would get that in immediately, but the Civil War has not been over recently enough for many people here to discuss that subject without uh, awkward emotions, as you know. Um, what about erecting a statue on the courthouse steps to honor uh, the Union soldiers the, the, and, 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 of course, the African Americans? Uh, do you think the Board of Supervisors would have the nerve to turn that down? <laughs> That's a delightful question. And I want you to know, I thought about that question all night long. Um, I think two things. Having, having a statue on the courthouse grounds um, feels to me to be oppressive because the reason for that particular statue being on the courthouse grounds is whomever comes in, uh, whether they be minority or majority, says, we don't care what you say, we are still in control. We are on the courthouse. You cannot conduct business without passing me, okay? I am not a proponent of tearing down monuments. I am a proponent of putting them in appropriate places. I think graveyards, I think maybe a park, whatever, but not where all of the body politic come to be treated equally. So, I'm always thinking about shared spaces. And particularly now when I watch the news, because I'm always annoyed when people do not let others speak and speak their peace. We live in this world together. We live in a shared space in this country. And we have to share that space. No one can take up 100% of it. So we've got to figure out a way to, if nothing else, recognize and say openly, we live in this shared space together. And what, do, what is it going to take for us to be human together? Because we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. That's how I feel. Where could a, a memorial or a statue honoring the um, African Americans who fought for the Union and the other Rappahannock uh, natives who fought for the Union, where, where could one, one be? Um, I, don't, I, I think it's pretty obvious if you talk about true self-evident, the people who support that statue in the courthouse ground are going to get ugly if, if you threaten their supremacy, and, and that's just a fact. And uh, uh, is there a way to heal this 
peacefully by compromising, saying you can keep your statute, j just we're having our own where, where, wherever it is. And, and uh, what, what would it take? And, and, and could that heal? Uh, I, I personally, I'd, I'd just go down and blow the thing up if I, you know, if I could, but <laughs> what, what would it take? You know, the, the, that's my heart. My, my intellect says try to reach out and heal. That, that's the purpose of one's education for quite a few years. Exactly. Well, I am not a Rappahannock citizen, and I think that your citizens would be very upset if I told them where to put something. Uh, but I would love to be part of the discussion. How's that? Well, let's do it. Okay. Terry, you, you have a question on the chat box um, from Steph Ritter. Um, okay. During your, during your research, did you become aware of any descendants of those men in Rappahannock or nearby counties? Yes, plenty. Um, and I have been in regular contact with the Rappahannock Historical. I shared all of my research with them, and I know that Dr. Toll has been doing a yeoman's job of researching as much as he can about the war in that period of time. Now, when I started looking at descendants, what I wanted to know was initially if any of the descendants were students at the George Washington Carver High School, because that's what I was supposed to be working on. And I was able to find quite a few. Um, so the answer to his question is yes. And if he wants to know who they are, I've got to go back and look at my notes. Hi, Additional um, questions? I have one. I happen to be one of those descent, one of those descendants, and I, I want to thank you so much for your research. And uh, actually, I'm a descendant of Titus Brooks. He was ah! one of the, <laughs> the four cavalry yes. soldiers. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, and it uh, and and quite a bit of my ability to find out that information was um, the Rappahannock Historical Society wonderful people that work there yes and they work so hard it seems to show both sides to show both sides of the stories there um i'm also found out that i'm a descendant of a revolutionary war soldier also from uh actually he was one in culpepper but he also lived well you know culpepper used to be uh rap used to be part of culpepper yeah so, um thomas shaw he's he's um he's been uh listed in the uh, Daughters of the American Revolutionary um, publication. I think it's called Forgotten Patriots or something of that type. Yeah. I can't remember the name. But um, I just want to thank you for just being, um, you know, uh, putting together this type of research, which, which is extremely hard for African-American um, people to find this kind of history. Although I have to say in Rappahannock County has been relatively easy. Um, there's a, um, um, the, um, there's a, there's a resource in Rappahannock County, uh, you know, right after the Civil War, they allow all former slaves to go and register their marriages for like 25 cents. Yeah. <laughs> Rappahannock County actually, yeah, they're one of the few counties in Virginia that still have access to that information. So that was really helpful. And my ancestor, Titus Brooks, actually um, had a son named Titus Brooks and a grandson named Titus Brooks. So it's been kind of difficult to pull the, the you know, pull them apart. But um, I was just happy to, when, when I found out about this presentation, I had to be here. And um, I want to thank you for what you do so much. You are welcome. And Titus Brooks has a pension file in the National Archives. I found, I, well, I, I haven't actually pulled the file yet, but I do have the records. I was referring to them when, when you were speaking. Good. Um, and I thought he at one time was actually in one of, hmm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No. 
Excellent. Oh, thank you. I was going to say, I thought he was in one of the VA hospitals. I could have sworn I saw something at one time, and I, but I was unable to, to tra track that down just yet. But that's something that I'm working on to um, uh, find that information. I do know that he had, um, I think it's his wife, and then also a granddaughter who both received his pension after he had passed away. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> very, very happy that you have that info. Thank you so much. Judy T. Terry, hi, it's Judy Toll. Hello, hello. <laughs> I'm listening to you, both of us are, and I want to tell people I'm the executive director of the Historical Society and we have a wonderful digital archives on African American history which we got a grant for four years so far to do that and that's one of the things that keeps us going and we have an enormous amount of information on all the folks here in the county so we welcome people to come and visit and share with us. I think that the Rappahannock Historical of all the counties that I research, you all have the deepest level of information and you're wonderful people. <laughs> I miss seeing we you know so that, much. But <laughs> yeah, I miss <laughs> seeing you a whole I know, lot. I know, I want to need and to get I'm in just, touch with you. Yeah, and as many people as can need to come and spend time there. Yes. Um, it's, it's an unparalleled resource. It really is, yes. And it's still going on. And we need to expand. <laughs> so much stuff available. On all the whole county, this is. Yes. Everybody. So it's good to see you, and we'll hopefully be in touch soon when we can get together. I hope so, okay. too. Because I we're still open our, our regular three days, if you ever get a chance to come up. Ooh. Yeah. With your mask. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for this program. It was really super. You are very welcome. Uh-huh. Okay. So keep Terry, up the I have good a work. Question. You, you mentioned earlier that Rappahannock County was kind of on par with other adjoining counties. I'm wondering how, Virgi if you have any information, how Virginia as a state compared with other states in the, in the Confederacy in terms of uh, sending colored or in the enrollment of colored troops in Union forces. Ooh, Virginia as a state actually did well. And I think I have that information. Hold, hold on one second. I actually do. Now, as a state, it says Virginia had 5,700 uh, U.S. colored troops. Other states, for example, Tennessee, it says, had 20,133. Yeah. Uh, Mississippi had 17,000. Louisiana had 24,000. So, oh, uh, in Kentucky had 23,700. So Virginia, compared to the other states that left the Union, uh, did not have nearly as many. Right. Interesting. Very. Do, do we... Thanks for that response. Do we have additional questions for Terry? I would have one if, if there's time. Sure. Uh, Terry, uh, 
what sort of reception did the veterans uh, receive in Rappahannock County or indeed or around Virginia when they returned uh, back home after the war? Oh, that's very sad. Um, many of them, many of them, particularly those going back, say, to their states in Georgia or Tennessee or Alabama, ended up actually being uh, tenant farmers for the people that they that used to own them. And some of them had very, very, very bad experiences. Overall, <clears throat> if you were going to the Deep South, if you were returning to the Deep South, certainly there were no parades for you, um, which is also kind of sad, considering that you were victorious in war. But keep in mind where they were returning to. They were returning to states that were not friendly to the idea of the United States of America. So there was no reason for many of the southern states to be welcoming to those coming back home. Um, I like using the example of James Whip because even though he may not have gotten a parade in Rappahannock, he was able to make a life for himself. Unfortunately, he lived long enough to see Reconstruction end and to see some of the gains that he thought he was um, earning for people to start to go away. My comfort is that he did die peacefully as an old man, and he died before Virginia changed the Constitution in 1902. That really made it oppressive. How was that? What, what did they do? Well, in 1902, let me give you just one concrete example. Um, the college, Virginia College, in Petersburg. It was called Virginia Normal um, and Collegiate Industrial, okay? And John Mercer Langston was the president. Well, because he was Oberlin educated, he believed in teaching the classics, mathematics, and not so much trades because he wanted the students, the, the black students to be able to compete in all kinds of environments. So he was not the least bit interested in them learning how to plow. He thought that they could learn that at home all the time, but you needed to know the classics and some law. Well, in 1902, Virginia changed its constitution and it forbade the college to teach classics and said, okay, you can only teach trades and agriculture. So they changed the name of the college and eventually it became just Virginia College for Negroes and the curriculum suffered. But they did have a teaching component because the goal was if you're going to be educated, your job is to go back to your communities and teach uh, African-American children how to read, and start little schools and that kind of thing. And that is the extent of the education that you're allowed to have in Virginia. Thank you. Do we, do we have any further questions for Terry? If not, I, I would like to thank you again Mr. for- Ms. Warner, this is Nan Roberts. Okay. Hello, how's everyone this evening? Good. Hello. I, I guess I don't want to be welcome. <laughs> thank you. I guess I don't really have a question, uh, but Terry, I want to thank you for uh, joining uh, Wakefield Country Day School this afternoon. I, I thank you so much. It's, uh, I always learn something when I hear uh, a presentation from you. And I was on the call, I mean, on the, uh, on the call a little bit late, but I heard most of it. And uh, again, I, I appreciate you so much. 
And uh, for anyone who's um, seen the Rappahannock News for the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of discussion about the monuments and uh, the monument, I should say, in reference to Rappahannock. And I think uh, if you read that, you know how I feel about it. And uh, Terry, I'm, I'm, you and I are on the same page. And um, in reference to having uh, some sort of uh, monument for African Americans and so on and so forth, I think perhaps the money could be better spent. Um, I was talking with someone recently that we have Rosenwald schools. And as most of you know, I work with Scrabble School as well, which is one of the four Rosenwalds in Rappahannock. Uh, the other three, uh, only, only one of the four has a historical sign out front. And um, if anybody would be interested, um, I plan on that. That's probably one of my uh, upcoming uh, kinds of tasks. Uh, is to try to uh, raise monies for the other Rosenwald schools to have a, a sign out there. So something like that, I think, would be um, much more appropriate uh, for the time and perhaps um, any scholarships, if anyone is interested. We have a Julia Ebody scholarship that's sponsored by Scrabble School or um, other uh, organizations like that. I think the money could be uh, better spent. But I Thank you so much for being here and thank you for the presentation. And uh, Mrs. Toll, it's good to see you as well. And um, I'm going to try to get to the Historical Society because I need to start doing some digging and searching on my family as well. So thank you. Thank you for those lovely comments. All of you, thank you for your questions. This has been a delight for me to share. And whatever research that I have, I always try to share it. So uh, if there are ever any other questions that you have, please feel free. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Terry. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you. Nan, thank you for introducing us to Terry. So with that, um, I guess what we'll sign thank off you. here and uh, in unless I... I heard another uh, question, which... No, I was just going to um, say you're so welcome. And I'm, I'm always glad to share folks that have a wealth of knowledge. And certainly Terry is one of them. So I was just excited to um, introduce her to Wakefield Country Day School. Good. Well, en enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. And thanks again. And next week we have, as I said earlier, a very diverse... Um, set of speakers. So, so we're switching from, from Terry to uh, catfish farming in America. <laughs> All Enjoy right. Your <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Bye. I don't know if we could achieve a more different, a different <laughs> subject. <laughs> Bye. 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 Stay Bye. safe, everyone. Thank you. you too. Thank you.